I think this year more than any, whilst there's always an alternative Christmas film out there, I think this year there's seems to be more than more than normal. You've got you've got the Leech, you've got Christmas Bloody Christmas, uh, Violent Night, uh, the Mean One. What do you think it is about this season that lends itself so well to, you know, the this more bitter slant on the season? Well, I think everyone has their own experience with the holidays. And, you know, horror fans are, you know, all about bastardizing any holiday. And, you know, what better one to do than, you know, the one that's traditionally known as the most joyful time of the year. Um, so I, I think really it's, it's just it's kind of fun to play with that. And I also think that Christmas, you know, from a visual standpoint, presents the most opportunities for production design and the way you can light it and just, you know, there's so many great set pieces that go into it. It's very, uh, you know, it's very um, well known, especially in America. So I think for American filmmakers, especially where the the sort of the the, the place that Christmas holds in this in this country's heart is, uh, it's always fun to play with. Do you have a particular favorite yourself? Is there a, a couple that you sort of have on on rotation? Well, I do. I still think the Black Christmas, the you know from 1974, is probably the the the, the the star on the top of my Christmas tree, as far as the one that I still end every Christmas with, it just kind of felt like the perfect movie, the perfect Christmas movie, but also uh, sort of the perfect film to really set up where the slasher craze would go. Um, wonderfully done. Bob Clark is just one of the best directors ever. And, you know, certainly had had his hand in other Christmas fair as well, which is, which is fun as a, it's a Christmas, Christmas aficionado. Um, other favorite ones, I mean, I love the Silent Night, Deadly Night films. Those are a blast. I'm particularly a fan of part five of The Toy Maker, um, <laughs> which is fun. I was just talking to someone about this. You know, they, those, I believe all of the Silent Night, Deadly Night films, as Christmas as they are, there's no snow in any of them. I mean, the majority of them are shot in Southern California. I know, I think it's part four is, takes place in like East Hollywood, but I don't know. Those films are still a total blast from top to bottom and just you know, sleazy beyond belief and went off in a, a crazy direction. Um, Dial Code Santa Claus, which I know has another title and I, uh, someone does a great Blu-ray of it out a few years ago. It was basically like Home Alone the year before Home Alone about a little kid that faces off against this, uh, this uh, sort of killer Santa that's breaking into his house. It's a French movie. Um, it's a total blast and one that I was only aware of a couple of years ago. Um, gosh, what other ones are there? Christmas Evil is a lot of fun. Um, don't open till Christmas. I mean, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think once you realize you're going to make a Christmas horror movie, there's definitely a lot to aspire to. But without trying to get too caught into the weeds of who's done what, I think you kind of look at like, you know, what really makes the good ones work. And I think it is that juxtaposition between um, characters who enjoy the holiday and something going on that is you know, not favorable to the holiday. And you spent a number of years in, in Catholic school. Did that, you know, were, the, were there any Davids that you took inspiration from? There was, there was a David who looking back on it was frighteningly similar in the way that he looked to the way that Graham Skipper looks now. Um, so much so that for a second there, Graham wanted to shave the beard before this. And I said, no, the beard has to stay. You you look identical to this guy, and you're probably about the same age. And you know he was sort of like an adjunct teacher there for a bit, so he looks very similar to what Graham ended up looking like, which was kind of strange um, because this guy, this teacher that I had, also had a bit of a meltdown and quit his job because um, he just couldn't handle it. But um, yeah, that's probably the biggest thing. And I think also you know looking at a film, you know, but thinking about The Exorcist 3 a lot and how it was really, you know, directed by William Peter Blatty, who was very much a, a devout Catholic throughout the rest of his life and actually realizing shortly after that, without really knowing it, William Peter Blatty's early life and sort of the relationship that he had with his mother throughout the years and the place that his mother held in his heart is very similar to the character of Father David, uh, which I only recently discovered. So I think trying to imbue it with a sense of um, feeling that it's it's made by someone that or it's made within a world that is genuinely Catholic like it absolutely turns it on its head but it's not you know hopefully not made by someone that was misinformed of 
sort of what the aesthetic of Catholicism is or sort of how uh, the guilt of being Catholic is imbued within the storyline. So I, I tried to make it feel as though it's, you know, coming from a world that is genuine, if anything. Yeah. And priest, like a priest in crisis, it's a, it's a story that many audience members will be familiar with. What do you think it is about these characters and, and their journey that does open themselves up to these different explorations? Well, you know, speaking from the Catholic side of things, there's not much that this movie does or says that the Catholic Church hasn't done or said about itself in its own way. So I, I think that you kind of have, um, I think that there is that preconceived notion of what this character is about with people going in. Even if you're not Catholic, you're probably, you know, somewhat aware of anything from a major scandal to a minor incident or whatever these things are. I think that people go in to a story, you know, probably having their minds made up about their own stance on religion. So I think that it's it's fun to play with characters in a story like that where people have their minds kind of made up. It gives you a good opportunity to, you know, go this way or go that way or subvert left or subvert right, whatever it is. Um, and yeah, I, I think um, I think it's uh, anytime you can have two characters going head to head, you know, juxtaposition seems to to have worked well for the couple of things that I've done. I, at least I've enjoyed those types of characters. Yeah. And Terry, Terry and David are an odd couple, you know, with Lexi sort of like an, an odd thruple. And I know that, you know, Jeremy and, and Graham both come from very different acting backgrounds. W at what point did you realize that that was gonna sort of enhance the, uh, the on-screen dynamic? Well, I think fortunately they'd worked together on a couple of movies, um, not in leading roles at the same time, but both of them have, have done films together in different variations and had scenes together, but not, not anything quite like this where they're really getting to go through through an entire scene. Um, yeah, it was very interesting because Graham's very traditionally trained, has a theater background. Jeremy comes at it from an acting side and a directing side, more similar to me, where we're fans of John Cassavetes and Robert Altman and these, these directors that sort of, you know, not made it up as they went along. There was always a plan in place, but I think that they were more open to things changing on the fly. Um, but I think also with Graham's theater background, there is a bit of that as well. I mean, Stuart Gordon, who he got to work with, was notorious for, you know, changing things on the fly. So um, I, I think it was it's great to see those two different worlds collide. Um, but yeah, there were definitely moments where, you know, Jeremy would kind of get in, uh, Jeremy and I were getting into conversations about, well, maybe Terry does this or Terry does that. And I remember there was one time in particular where I told Graham, I was like, okay, now he's going to do this and then you're going to do this. And he's like, well, Father David would never do that. And I thought about it for a second. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Like you, you shouldn't let him do that. He's going to try to do it and you can stop him, but you shouldn't let him, even though you've let him get away with a lot up until a certain point. Um, there was a great moment where Graham was like, well, from here on out, there's, I would not let him do that around me. And I was like, yeah, you're right. And that was a perfect example of sort of looking at the script and saying, no, let's, let's reel it back to exactly as how you had it written, even though we have this gag that's funny and it kind of up the ante a little bit in the scene. It, it didn't make sense for the character at that moment. And I think um, one of the things that I really like about the film is the is the visual style, um, and particularly during the Never Have I Ever scene. I was just wondering if you could um, talk through um, some of your your intention behind uh, the look and feel of the film. Yeah, I mean, we kind of divided that scene into three different sections, where each section becomes increasingly more handheld and sort of in your face. You know, we spent an entire night working on that scene, and it's probably the more one of the more scripted sort of planned out sequences in the movie with really no improv much at all but um yeah you know I I think coming off of sadistic intentions where everything was very locked down and the camera was very steady I just wanted to make a movie in particular this scene where I could just grab the camera and get in people's face there was really no there was no spot that the DP wasn't willing to go or where he wasn't willing to throw a light or put a lens or anything like that so I thought that that was exciting it was just kind of getting to really really be handheld with it it's almost like the, you know the little film that could you know the festival circuit it's picked up more and more and more momentum but I guess it's for me it's one of those films that can be analyzed in in many different ways have you found that people are bringing their own experiences and personality to the way that they're interpreting this film I think so definitely yeah uh, you know, like I said I mean I, and I kind of knew that going in which I think is why I tried to take as straightforward of an approach as I could. You know, I knew that 
I got to present these characters as honestly as I could, specifically Graham's character, who, you know, has a lot of beliefs and goes down a lot of trains of thought that are, you know, in completely opposite of me. But because I, you know, grew up in that world, I just know, I know that headspace. And I felt like to present that character any differently would be um, sort of, you know, not, not the genuine way to go about it. But I think trying to just present characters as they are um, and put them in a room together would give people the opportunity to put their own experience on it. And I, I think that, you know, there's one thing, I think it was Graham that even brought this up to me while we were making the movie. He goes, you know, this movie feels very like non-judgmental, at least of e the characters of each other. It gets, you know, it gets messy towards the end and certainly mm -hmm. people start weaponizing words and using things against each other. But it, the, the way that it starts off is really, no one's passing judgment. And he was like, you know, this movie is also very body conscious. I felt, he felt like, all the characters were different shapes and sizes and that no one ever really passed judgment on one another. And that was something that I, I, I was really happy to hear him say that and something that I thought about more after the fact and was hopefully, you know, audiences take away from that as well, that there is, that there is a genuine sense of just wanting to help one another um, in the first half. Yeah. I mean, some people, some people I know that I've seen at the festivals, you know, they're calling it the, the horniest horror movie of the year. You know, how, uh, how are you feeling about that accolade? Well, I feel like a lot of, while we were making the film, we, we, we kind of phrase it as that as such. So maybe we, maybe we put that into the Christmas era a bit, but yeah. And I think that kind of goes back to just being, you know, non-judgmental and open is that, you know, the sexuality is very fluid throughout the movie. Um, you know, people's backgrounds are very fluid. I, I felt like there was, a, you know, I explained to Jeremy at one point, I said, the character of Terry is, he's this. There's not anything that Terry isn't. He's almost all things all at once. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is there's not anything that he won't try once, so much so to where he takes it upon himself to actually take an interest in what David's talking about, even though it's not who he is necessarily. Um, so yeah, so everything from the sexuality on down, I, I think we just tried to keep really open and fluid and just kind of let the story take it where it goes and not let anyone's um, you know, preference, so to speak, uh, dictate where things go. And the screening at Fright Fest gave you the opportunity to, to meet Team Arrow in the flesh. You know, how has that collaboration been? Working with Arrow has been great. I had met them all when I first was in London for Fright Fest with Sadistic Intentions. But, you know, once we once we made the deal for this movie, it was paramount to get over there and spend more time with them and definitely got to know, you know, Lou and Kevin and everyone a lot, a lot more. Um, and yeah, they, they've been a great, great champion of this film. You know, this is really the first time my films have had a, a proper physical release. So, you know, even just having this box of Blu-rays that arrived um it's just it's incredible to see and to have to have the arrow logo on the spine next to other arrow titles on the shelf it's uh yeah you know for a physical media collector it doesn't get any better than that and one of the extras is uh your short film pod which is is very different in in tone and style to to the feature films that you've produced are you hoping to maybe get back into into sci-fi and sort of uh explore that a bit more in the in the future it's possible. Yeah, a, a lot of my early short films um, were very sci-fi focused. And I think, you know, I think part of it, there is still a genuine interest in sci-fi, but I think a lot of it also was getting into short films and sort of approaching a short as not wanting to just have a couple people in a room or not just have a short film that felt, you know, maybe contained like certain parts of the features have, whereas the features have more time to go other places. But I really wanted to just have a short film that was visually impactful and I said well if I am going to set it in a single location let's put it in the cockpit of a spaceship um and that was great you know I, I in some ways some of those short films had bigger crews than even these feature films have um in terms of department heads and some of the things that we build for them so yeah I, I do have an interest in getting back into sci-fi but the pod was a great experiment in um yeah a, a kind of again a, a tight little chamber piece I mean, I would, I would definitely be interested to see some, some more sci-fi for me. And I guess sort of the, the final question, um, you know, why should people put the leech on their Christmas list? I already have mine pre-ordered. So I was like to my husband, don't buy it me because it's coming, it's coming early. But why should people stick this on their Christmas list? 
Well, I think you should put it on your Christmas list, first of all, if you're an Arrow video collector, because it's a great addition to an already wonderful canon of films. I think if you're a Christmas fan, it's the perfect addition to the holiday watch list. Uh, if you're just one of those people that keeps up on all the movies that are coming out each year, be a great triple feature with Violent Night and Christmas Bloody Christmas. I know there's a handful of other Christmas movies coming out, but you know, a couple of the filmmakers behind those two movies are, are friends and they've been supportive of the leech as well and I, I i think that those three movies together would make a pretty uh pretty deranged cocktail on christmas eve <laughs> also with you know with christmas bully christmas graham and jeremy are both in the film as well jeremy has a pretty great uh role as a police sheriff who looks like a character out of uh, the first rambo movie <laughs> Yeah, he's serving. He's definitely serving a look in, uh, in Christmas. <laughs> he sent me a photo from set, and I said, "What did they do to your hair?" <laughs> it's got the perm going and the Jeffrey Dahmer glasses. Yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> and they would. They would pair. Would pair quite well. Um, yeah. But I am going to. Um, I'm going to let you go, and I say I can't wait until my copy uh, lands through the letterbox so I can watch it again. I think it normally we do an anti-Christmas film on Christmas Eve, like like last year we watched Psycho Gorman and we've watched like Dead Girl and that. But I think this year maybe we we'll, maybe we will go a little bit more traditional. And, uh, we'll watch them. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you so much, Kat.